thanks for joining me and, and giving me your time. I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, but no but I guess the first thing, there's so many things I wanted to to cover. One of the first things I think is taking it back to when you started playing and, and how you got into the game and where the love for the game came from for you personally and and um, and what your story was within the game of AFL. Yeah, it's interesting um, when I look back on it. I mean, and my son asked me a question for oh, middle of last year. He said, Dad, if you could be born in any era, when, when would you rather be born? I was sort of a pretty profound question from a 24-year-old. I'm like, <laughs> wow. And I sort of thought to myself then, I thought, and I said to Dylan, I said, Dylan, actually, when I was born, it was a pretty cool time. You know, like, you know, in the, I'm 56 now, born in 1963. So in, in the early 80s, um, you know, um, was when I went to Fitzroy. But prior to that, my parents bought a house in, you know, in a, a new development out in Donvale, you know, 40 minutes out of town. And it was pretty much all sport. You know, we had a, I played the local tennis club. I joined a local Nunawading Bas Vikings basketball team. And then the Nunawading Spectres picked me up as the rep team. And then the Beverly Hills Footy Club. And when he asked me that question, it was funny. I looked back and I thought, it was a pretty cool time, you know, because all we really did, we didn't have any homework. There's no such thing as homework. So you'd, you'd come home from school, you'd throw your bag down, you'd grab your bed, you might on toast, then you'd head outside for, you know, two, three hours. You might ride your bike to your mate's house, you know, play footy, play cricket in the driveway, play basketball, uh, basketball ring in the backyard, go up and play tennis with my brother. So really, my passion was probably because my parents, just where they lived, and my dad would play footy, and he was involved in a lot of different sporting organisations. He was president of the tennis club. My mum was a really good tennis player. So when I look back, and, and it's sort of all about that role modelling, isn't it? You know, my parents just loved sport, and my brother and sister did, and we just played it. And then eventually, I got invited down to Fitzroy in a very dis different system to what it is now. And we were just zoned to an area. So then I got invited down to Fitzroy. and But my love of sport really started through my parents, really. Mm. It's interesting you're saying about... It's a bit of an interesting question from your son there, like to, to, to ask something like that, because you do get people who have played in different eras. I even get it in cricket. Cricket's sometimes one of those things where people talk about my era was best, my era was, was better, and now is better, yeah. and things like that. It's just, it's just different. Like, it's hard to say, like, who was, ha who was having a... A better time obviously the money and things like that are, are massively influenced now um but yeah i wouldn't it's a real tussle between who's saying who's got the better era and who's got the the tougher side of it i guess um i do hear of people talking it's about funny, afl being one tougher of the things that, yeah, one of the things that drives me crazy a bit is when the commentators you know these old commentators now in footy so it was so much better i'm, I'm like well hang on i played you know, from 1981 all the way through to 1998. And I'm certainly not one that ever says that the game was better. It was just different. You know, we trained mm -hmm. different. And so when you get these old timers that always look back and, oh, the, the game was better then and we were better and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it's just a, it's a crazy argument, you know, and I never subscribed to it. I think we played in a certain era. We had some great players, great games, but the game of AFL is in fantastic shape now as, as most sports are. Yeah. So, what sort of player would you describe yourself as when you were when you were playing? Yeah, probably my main asset was just my ability to read the game. I think when I look back on it now, look, I was a pretty good athlete, but not an exceptional athlete. I I was always you know in school sports, so I was always okay at the hundred and two hundred, and yeah, you know, okay as a swimmer, and yeah, you know, I was a very very good basketball player. You know, I played for state state basketball for Victoria. So it was a really good basketball player. And I think that helped my footy no end, just that 360 awareness, the ability to make decisions, you know, under pressure and in traffic, you know, some of the best AFL players, Scotty Penderby is a great basketball player. And through the history of our sport, a lot of really good basketball players. Paddy Mills was a really good football player, um, which is interesting. So I think my main aspect was just the ability Ability to understand the game and I could sort of see the game when I look back on it I could see the game better than my opponents a lot of the time you know my athleticism was pretty good you know but I'd play on guys who were more athletic than me and I was a bit undersized often for the for the position that I played at center back or center forward so I had to use my brain to, to sort of get around those sort of things um, so I read the game really well and I think as I said I think I survived in AFL football more because of how 
you know, smart I was as a player and I was able to work things out really, really quickly. And that's probably the, the biggest strength that I had. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge thing on athleticism now in the game. Like you look at AFL players, like they are just pure athletes and they're the jumps they do, the the speed they have. Um, how Do you think there's been a bit more of a transition between the physicality and the thinking of the game and, and there's less thinkers, more athletes now? Yeah, transitions from time to time. You're right. I mean, it, it's sort of coming back out a little bit of that era, I think, because we've got 18 teams now. But there certainly was an era there where, you know, the, the, the Greg Williams type player, you know, who was just super, super smart, but wasn't a great athlete, was sort of getting overlooked. I think we've come out of that period a bit now. So clearly the combination of the two is, is sort of the unstoppable force. But it's probably a different form of athleticism. We, we ran a lot because we didn't have interchange. So our running was up around 20 Ks and we didn't get taken off the ground at all. So the players I played with at Fitzroy were incredibly aerobically fit. And I would say, I talked to my teammates about it. One thing I would say is we were definitely fitter um, aerobically back then, you know, because we just, you know, the way we trained and the way we had to play, et cetera, et cetera. It's much more specialized now. So there's a lot more sort of speed, endurance type running and, you know, hundreds and two hundreds and 60 metre sprints and one minute, two minute, three minute runs and things like that. Um, so it, it's, it's a bit cyclical. So we're sort of coming back a little bit to that smart footballer again, but you, you've got to be able to run long distances. I think if you can't run long distances and you haven't got great aerobic capacity, it's very, very difficult to be a, unless you've got elite talent in another area where that's speed um, you know, your jumping capacity, your size, your strength or whatever. So one of the things you do have to do with AFL is, you know, we the guys now run, you know, back up to 15 to 18 kilometres a game, you know, so it's a very aerobic sport. So it, it is cyclical. I think we're seeing a little bit more of the smarter player getting recruited again, which is a, it's a good thing. Yeah, and, and a lot of your story um, when you went into coaching goes around culture. When you were playing, how much of that were you paying attention to as an individual? Was that something that you in inside took on quite a lot or was it uh, something that grew eventually? Yeah, initially not at all. And it's funny when I look back at it again, when, you, when you've when you sort of been through it, you, are, you can identify times that were real big moments in your career. And the fact that I got invited to Fitzroy was unquestionably the most important thing because I didn't know anything about culture. We didn't talk about culture at Fitzroy. We just had incredible role model leaders, you know, and when I look back on the time and I started to realise when I became captain in Fitzroy, my habits just really came from the people I watched and saw, you know, great player. Gary Wilson was my first captain, incredibly talented, but amazing work ethic. Bernie Quinlan, Brownlow medalist, incredible talent, amazing work ethic. Mickey Conlon, Laurie Serafini. So at the time, I had no idea what culture was. And and what I learned from that period, doesn't matter, even now we're, we're and we'll talk about what we created at Sydney and tried to do at Melbourne and Hawthorne, do it Geelong, you know, with things on the wall and leadership groups, et cetera, et cetera. Now you can work on it. But back then, it really was what you saw. You know, this is what you do. You just fit in or you don't fit in. And Fitzroy just had incredible people, great human beings, great off the field, great on the field. So it wasn't until I really started being captain that I started thinking more around my responsibility in creating the culture. Yeah, you know, then going to Sydney as a player, as a 31-year-old, and understanding about culture and helping Paul Kelly as captain there and Darren Creswell and Mark Bays and Andrew Dunkley and Tony Lockett came up as well. So probably mid-20s when I started to understand what culture was. And then by the time I started Sydney, I had a really good understanding. Um, when I started coaching Sydney, I had a really good understanding of what it was and I didn't really want to leave it to chance. And that's why we started the program we did at the Swans. Yeah, that's quite interesting that you, like you said at the start about role models, um, and it sounds like you had, inadvertently, you had great role models for you to build a, a sort of a standard culture for you. I think that's really valuable when you're young. Um, you're just hoping that you go into an environment that has a culture, that has something that I know from teams that I entered in, um, I've been in good cultures and I've been in bad cultures um, and probably even cultures that didn't even know they were bad, probably kidded themselves a little bit and thought they were they were good cultures, but you kind of step away and go, I don't think this is um, 
don't think we're living our values. I don't think we're we're kind of doing this right. And very hard to to make a change yeah. as a young player to stand up at the time. Um, I kind of went through a bit of a transitioning period, definitely through uh, through the, the years of my sport. Um, so with your career ending, and then you went into coaching. I found that re- having read your book, I thought it was pretty cool that you d- you describe you have a gap year in America, um, and you go out to America because um, your wife your wife is American, right? Yeah, yeah. So you went you went out to to America, and what was your experience like out there, going and seeing all the teams? out there because it is a different ball game sport over there like it is it is madness yeah look it was probably the best thing i did prior to going in october 1998 and you've read it in the book is write down 25 points it just happened to be 25 that i liked about my coaches and didn't like about my coaches and that was that proved crucial and i didn't really i don't even really know why i did it like because i didn't know what i was going to coach but i wanted to look through the eyes of a player what i liked about the leaders so that was an invaluable exercise and then, yeah, I went, embarked on a trip to America and you live with my wife's family and, and wanted to use the year to sort of research and learn. So I was really lucky to get inside uh, the Denver Broncos, the San Francisco 49ers, the San Diego Chargers, the Chicago Bears, and the topical at the moment, the Chicago Bulls, which was amazing. So the learnings I had from that was, was incredible, you know, and probably the, the two things that stuck out for me were... I went to the Chicago Bears facility and they had a, like an $80 million facility, which was incredible. Uh, two outdoor fields, one had you know heating underneath in case it snowed, um, video, um, two cameras at either end, two cameras at either side, and they videotaped every single training session. And that's something we started to do at Sydney when I first took over. No one was really reviewing training at uh, in the AFL. So that was really pivotal really key the other really pivotal moment was going to Denver Broncos and talking to the head of player personnel and had a really good discussion around you know what they look for in players and he said to me look they always go for character you know if there's, there's two guys and they're reasonably similar in terms of athleticism or one slightly better in athleticism they'll always take the character guy the guy that's been the valedictorian and been in the chess club or whatever, you know, been involved in, in certain charities. And that was a really big moment as well. Yeah. They're, so, so they're probably the two of the yeah, really pivotal moments, you know, in, in my philosophy as well. Um, and the third one, which I'll touch on is just going, which is topical at the moment is I went and spoke to the Chicago Bulls fitness guy and spoke about Michael Jordan I remember among other things and he said to me back then which is great watching the last dance at the moment yeah he said to me way back in 98 but we don't really see Michael much from a training point of view yeah he's got his own fitness guy he does all his weights and all his running outside the club but he said when he comes here and he gets on the basketball court he's an animal he just terrorizes everyone he's the most competitive person I've ever seen in my life so that's quite interesting looking at that through the eyes of um you know someone who talked to the fitness guy and back in 1998 have you been watching the last dance oh mate, it's the best piece of television i've seen in you know 50 years since i started watching gilligan's island back in you know <laughs> back in 1970 something it's fascinating <laughs> it's fascinating isn't it i mean the the, the kind of this multiple stories that are going on in it and the to and and fro in of of both how good he really was like how good he wanted to turn it on and he could win games and but i think some of the stuff that um i really liked was how the team wouldn't have won if he didn't have people that were supporting him around him that it really does hit home like it didn't really matter how good he was like if he didn't have scotty pippen dennis rodman these guys that were around him that to to make him the player he really was like there's such a there's still that team vibe about it i think that's been really eye-opening as well a hundred percent i remember reading phil jackson's book and that was again another pivotal moment for me and in the book which which explains in the documentary phil's ability to say to michael michael we know you're good but your job is to make everyone else better and and his ability to do that and then understand that it wasn't about him it was actually about him making the team better and bringing the team in and and once that transformation happened, and I I had multiple conversations during my time coaching with players about that very, very conversation that Phil Jackson had. And I remember one player I had a chance to talk to at Sydney, he was getting a bit frustrated with his role. And I said, mate, 
if you keep playing your role, we'll win a premiership and then people will say what a great player you are. And I could tell you sort of thinking, is that really right? And then when we won the premiership in 2005, he said, mate, you're hundred percent right. You know, it's a sum, it's the sum total of the team. And, and what I loved about Michael as great as he thought he was. And it's interesting talking, you know, when you see him now as a 57 year old, but I love when you actually go back to his interviews because you can't fudge those interviews that he was doing back in the 90s. And he no. was always so humble. He was always so humble and shaking hands and talking about team. And he was never this arrogant athlete that we see out of the American athletes now. You know, it's all about me, 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 me. Mm. So as great as Michael was, and clearly he knew he was great. You can, you can hear him talk about it. But there was always this part of him that knew that, that the team is really important. My main role is to help everyone get better. And the number of times he talks about Dennis Rodman, you know, how he couldn't have won without Dennis, how Scotty Pippen, he loves Scotty Pippen. And he just drove his, his other teammates to be successful. Scotty Burrell in the last one, Steve Kerr, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, if anyone listening out there, even if you're not a basketball fan, it's an incredible journey through culture, high performance culture, and team, it, it really is. It's just so invaluable to, to watch it. Yeah, it's quite interesting seeing those old teammates of him saying in retrospect, like looking back going, he was an asshole, like hated him, like he was just brutal. But then they, they're they now having reflected on it years later going, it's exactly what I needed. I wouldn't have changed it. I wouldn't have wanted it anyone because he was dragging us along. He was taking his standard and bringing us along. Yep. And he, he was that, he was a culture change for them. Like he was creating that, culture without them knowing and they're tussling with it and they're they're pulling against it and that's actually something we can we'll get on to but um so that, that yeah what an amazing way to to learn and did you get to meet phil jackson at all i did i went to the lakers a little bit later on i got to meet phil jackson it was pretty cool because i mean as you all know watching if you're watching the last dance luke longley played for chicago bulls and luke's a Western Australian and knows Australian rules footy. So I was in the gym with um, one of the fitness guys and I was showing him some AFL footy and Phil walked over and said, oh, and introduced himself. And I spoke to him. He goes, yeah, you Luke used to show me this shit all the time. You know, it's like, <laughs> and I was laughing. Yeah. So we had a bit of a joke in the gym and just a really cool guy, you know, to spend time with. But, you know, an amazing capacity to understand about standards but also to understand about individual personalities. So mm. just a, a great, great leader of his time. I think how he, he managed to like tame, tame Dennis Rodman to an extent was quite a, a really impressive thing. His, he's got that real mindful approach and um, a holistic approach to the athletes and definitely needed it at that time. I think he's someone that I've, I've definitely gravitated towards looking at how he did things and, and how he, how he does things. I think it's super impressive. Um, in, in that era as well so you you fast forward in sort of a little bit and you, you finish your career you go into um you go into sydney and you take over at sydney you've you've got your 25 points and i think your your coaching your little yeah your 25 points that you make about how you want to do it you really saw that through the eyes of a player that was something that you felt you were looking at that from not how am i going to be a coach onto players, but how can I see this as, as through the eyes of a player? Was that really the the agenda with that that list? Yeah, because what I found it was interesting. What I found about my coaches, and this is what I picked up throughout my career, the older that they, they're all ex players, but the older they got, the more uh, they'd been away from their playing days, and then the less empathy you had they had in understanding what the players went through. So it really was just an observation I made, and then. I thought, well, how do you keep that connection as a coach? If you are going to be a coach, how do you actually keep the connection and understand what the players are going through? And then I thought, well, the only way you can really do that is write something down as a player. So I wrote that down through the eyes of a player. And it was just incredibly valuable when I was getting frustrated as a coach to pull it out of my desk for eight and a half years at Sydney. I had it there. And then it was the first document I took out of Melbourne. So suddenly I could sort of see what Paul Ruse, the player, was looking for from his coach and that was just so valuable to keep me grounded keep me accountable to the coach i wanted to be and it allowed me to keep the connection between the players yeah it's clearly you still get frustrated and still have your moments but the ability to be able to go back and go right that's what paul roos the player was looking for why why aren't i giving that to my players now hang on you said you weren't going to do this 
why are you doing it and stop doing it mm -hmm. so so because do you think um do you think that your well, as your transition came from playing to coaching you you transitioned quite like I guess you could say smoothly you went very quickly into assisting do you think that helped quite soon after you didn't have a massive break you didn't break away from the sport for a long time you just kind of went and transitioned over a few years into into coaching I think because I'd already formulated a philosophy in my mind it was a bit of a gamble but I I, I think there's a couple of things I had a philosophy that I wanted to test and if it didn't work, I was always prepared to work or walk away. So I don't think it was necessarily the time frame, although the time frame helped that I still was pretty connected to my playing days. So I was still pretty close to the players. Um, and I had a really good relationship with the Swans players. So that definitely did help. But I think it was more that I had a really firm philosophy in my mind. I had a document that was going to hold me accountable to that. I had a way that I was going to do it. And I think, again, what helped me was that I always felt like if this is not right and I don't get it right, well, I just walk away and say, no, I was wrong. You know, I just, I was wrong and I let someone else to do it. So they were probably the key factors in the, you know, in the sort of success we had because I was always prepared to work, walk away if it didn't work. Hmm. So, so when you uh, did start taking over at Sydney full time, and you were you were head coach, you you write out your your sort of manifesto of what you wanted to to do. Um, I've been a part of teams where we've done this. We've we've had success in the past, um, but then we were having a real change of guard really within a team. And we did we set about a, a culture change. We you go and do the values. You find out what it is that really resonates with the team. Um, you, your team hadn't won in well when you won the premiership it was a breaking a 72 season spell um, of not winning how was your what was it kind of like in those first moments of introducing what you wanted to do and, and what do you think was the, the catalyst and the main aspect of, of getting the players on board to a new culture change we're going to do things differently this is going to be change um and, and was there was there uh, friction? Yeah, I think I think because when we, we were pretty successful under Rodney Eade, so I think we we'd seen a little bit of success. We played in the grand final in '96, so Rockers had done a pretty good job, particularly technically, and he's a really smart coach. Then we had a changing of the guard. To your point, so Paul Kelly left, um, and Andrew Dunkley left. They retired the same day. Tony Lockett came back, but he left at the start of 90, uh, 2002. So it was a, even though it was a gamble, we probably had a group that was ready for something different. You know, they were a pretty young group. I think Darren Creswell, Jason Ball, Paul Williams. There's a few older guys, but they weren't um, super strong personalities in a sense. Like, they weren't divisive personalities. Not that the other guys were, but there was no... When we started, I, I didn't have a fear that, oh, okay, this guy won't jump on or this guy won't jump on because of the mix. Probably the greatest fear that we had was that Paul Kelly was such a great captain. We didn't really have an obvious successor. Now, that turned into an opportunity as it was, not a fear, but there was that fear around who is going to be captain. But when we sat down as a group and talked about what we stand for and what our behaviours were, it became increasingly obvious through that process that Stewie Maxfield was going to be the guy. And again, it was a huge leap of faith in AFL football because I remember... I remember people at the time were going, Stewie Maxfield, captain. Like, he's not in their best sort of 10 players. How can he be captain of a footy club? So it was a massive shift in AFL football, not just for the Swans, but the competition in general. Um, so it was, but the time was right. And you talked about, you know, culture changes. Stewie was the culture changer. Stewie was Michael Jordan, you know, and I say this respectfully, Stewie, without the talent of Michael Jordan. But he was the culture changer. He was the guy that said, righto, this is what we're going to do. Ruzi's given us some empowerment. We've created a set of behaviours. I'm not going to let the coach down. I'm not going to let my teammates down. I'm going to drive these standards relentlessly over and over and over again. So I say this a lot. Without Stewie, it would have been a lot different and probably would have been a lot slower process. But, but having Stewie Maxfield unearthed as this great leader through our process just fast-tracked it incredibly because he just drove it 
yeah, he was amazing. I can't speak highly enough of him as the leader. Yeah, I think that's a that's probably a real as through reading your book, and I'm resonating with the story the the story I had in my career when we were going through the this culture change. And I really think that our leaders didn't drive home that culture, which then, yeah. in in retrospect, created anarchy. Like it was chaos because, yeah. it, and it's not. I don't mean chaos as in it was chaotic everywhere. I think underlying subconscious chaos, which was. We don't know where the lines are. We don't know what what's good, what's bad, what can be done. If he's if the leaders are doing something different, are the are the juniors meant to be doing the same thing or something different? Um, yeah. So how much of because I know you talk about empowering players a lot, and I think that's a great thing to do. Get, putting the ownership, making them create the the structure, the the have the behaviours that they want to have. How much did you look for a leadership group so people within it to kind of really on earth it did they take on to it did they start to if people didn't pull their weight or didn't go in the direction you wanted to did they sort it out or was it you who was having to to sort it out yeah i think your point about role models is absolutely spot on there's no point you can't drive a high performing culture if your leaders aren't role models and the, one of the best things that michael jordan said i never asked anyone to do anything that i didn't do myself and they're, I loved that they're line, yeah. in a nutshell yeah, there it is in a nutshell. And that was really the focus for our leadership group, both in Sydney and Melbourne. It was, guys, you're in the leadership group. These are the behaviours. You have to do them over and over and over and over again. And we were pretty fortunate at Sydney. They, they took to it reasonably quickly. And as I said, Stewie was just spot on with it and drove his teammates really quickly. So we had a really good leadership group. But I think the other thing we did as a coaching group is we never shielded our star players away from the vision. We never, we, we had a way we wanted to play. We had our standards. And if people did them well, we said, well done. If they didn't do them well, it wasn't a case of, oh, we can't put Adam Goods up there. We can't really put Stewie Maxfield or Barry Hall up there. It was just, this is the what we do. And that's, and that's what the coach in those situations, that's what the CEO in those situations has to do. You can't have one set of rules for 40 players and a different set of rules for four. It just doesn't work that way. And I think because our coaching group was so strong on it, our leadership group was so involved in it. And after a while, to your point, is I would often, sometimes I'd see Stewie walk past my office and he'd be yawning. I'd say, mate, you okay? He goes, oh, Ruzi, we had to get up at five o'clock in the morning to do a punishment. I said, oh, shit, what happened? He goes, oh, don't worry about it. We've sorted it out. So they would actually sort it out themselves. Amazing. The, I didn't have to get involved in something. So it was an – and I say this, if you can get the system right in business and in sport, it's just an incredibly, incredibly good system, an incredibly empowering system, and everything spins off it. It just works so well, and you'll get some amazing results. I thought the bit where you um, would create you you had the team in for a meeting and you asked them to to find the leaders within the team and and a part you mention is that most people will gravitate towards the best player and naturally sometimes yep. even the best players in the team will gravitate and think I oh, I should be the leader but I think the amazing part was about how the team picked up like rookies it picked up younger players who hadn't, hadn't played much there were some experienced guys and they were they were self regulating themselves knowing that they were picking up the players who had the best attitude and things like that 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 for me was something that shone through massively that no one in the team it didn't matter if you were 20 games in or 200 games in yep. you were if you were a good person and you were a good leader and you lived values that they resonated with it I think that could be tough to, for some teams, some organisations to take on board because they'll naturally want to gravitate towards the best players and the best performers. And that's why it's so important to get congruency when you do it. And, and I take my hat off to the and my coaches that I had at the time, our fitness team, our medical staff and our players because from day one when we did it at the Cop Harbour, they bought into it and they said, I guess then I'm going to really take this voting process seriously, get talent and I'm going to just look at the behaviours we've agreed on and I'm going to vote accordingly. And I think because we took it serious from day one, because we had Stewie driving it, we had the coaches driving it and no one, no one was outside the system. And it's so important if you're trying to do that, you can't have an outlier in the system. 
And that's not mm. to say everyone falls in from day one. That's not what I'm saying. But you've got to hold them accountable, whether that's your best salesperson that doesn't turn up the meetings, whether it's your best, you know, accountant that is always late, whether it's your best law, you know, lawyer that doesn't make phone calls back or whatever. It doesn't matter. You've got to reward and challenge the behaviour. And then eventually they act their way into the system or act their way out of the system. So it's not a case of everyone, you know, certainly at Sydney, not everyone fell in the line straight away, but we, we would reward and challenge constantly. And then players acted their way in and acted their way out. And then and to your point, players knew that if I do this, then I'm going to have a pretty good chance of success at this footy club. And that's ultimately what's proven to be correct. Yeah, uh, that's... Um... Yeah, I, I really like that. I think um, that it, kind of managing yourself from within that that's a that's such a big part of it. And um, how did how did you um, manage potential egos and those guys that may have had friction within it? Um, and were there egos in the team at the time? Were there people that were were frictioning the the change and didn't want change and things like that? Not a great deal, but, but I think it's sort of the chicken of the egg. We we still had to sh- we still had to win, so I think you always got to, and that's the danger as a coach because to keep Michael Jordan playing team basketball, the team has to win because eventually he's going to just take over. So we we had a pivotal moment. I think in my first year, we we one win and three losses. We were four goals down or three goals down at three quarter time, and. And I remember walking out of the coach's box and going, I thought, no, I don't. We're, not, we're just not doing the things that we think make us a good team. So we talked about it three-quarter time. We kicked 10 goals in the last quarter. We won the game. I think from that moment, the players realised this works. You know, if I really adhere to the system, if I play my role within this team really well, we can beat some really good teams. And the next two weeks... We beat Brisbane Lions in Collingwood, which were the two grand finals from the year before. So you have to have some wins along the way mm. and you have to show those wins, which is really, really important. And once you do that, then it's basically managing it themselves. It's constant. We, I did a, um, had a discussion with Dave Misson, who was my fitness guy during that period. It was fascinating to look through his eyes. And I said, Dave, what did you learn? He said, look, it's just constantly getting better, constantly reviewing constantly working out what worked well and what didn't work well, constantly holding yourself accountable to your behaviours and your KPIs. And he said, from his point of view, that's what the Sydney Swans did so well during that period of time that he was with it. So it was, it was really uh, refreshing to hear it from him, who was part of it, but looked a little bit from outside of it. And that's what he saw with the system. So as you were... As that system starting to take shape and it's I think that's a great point like you have to do you do have to have those wins to show it's working and, and hope that they come along um how were you how were you managing sort of giving a load of account giving accountability to the players and then also because with that can seem sometimes like coaches can shift responsibility towards the players and be like, well, I'm putting a lot on them. So therefore some coming off me, where were there moments where you would step in and sort of maybe redirect the ship or um, yeah, or, or go right, right guys, we're not, this is, we're not living this and were there hiccups along the way? Yeah, hundred percent. It's not as simple as just letting it go. You're right. You, you were always stepping in and stepping back and stepping in and stepping back. And I remember there was times where I'd say to the guys, guys, look, um, the leadership goes, so guys, let me take the discipline back off you. Let, let me just, don't you worry about it. You know, we, we're not playing well. So it is a big responsibility. It's not easy. I mean, in terms of reviewing, really, I did most of the reviews. So we had a really set structure in the coaches doing the reviews, meeting with the players. So it's about your cadence, you know, making mm. sure you've got a regular cadence, making sure you have regular discussions. I think too many companies think we'll put a sign on the wall, we'll bring some people into this building and we'll become a team. It just doesn't work that way. You know, and we will create a culture that we will have no reward and challenge system. You know, we'll have no meetings. It just doesn't happen that way. You have to work on your culture. You have to work on your relationships. So there was absolutely times where I just talked to the players. How are you guys feeling? Bruzy, it's getting a bit tough. Yeah, we, we're having to do too much of this, mate. Guys, don't worry about it. I'll take that back off you. Are you guys okay with doing this? Yeah, we're okay with doing this. 
another great thing about having a leadership group, especially, you know, with the AFL footy, there was one captain. So with the leadership group, we would often say, and we'd have multiple captains at, at Sydney. The great thing about that was talking to one of the captains and saying, look, look, Leo, mate, you concentrate on your game. Let's let Kirky do the, the um, media this week. Let's let Kirky do this or let's let Barry Hall. So you're able to share the workload with your leadership group. So it wasn't one guy that always got burdened within your mm. leadership group. So there was just so many advantages to having a leadership group and having, but yeah, we, we often had to have discussions around they're doing too much. They're not doing enough. Am I helping you? Are you helping me? So it's not a case of just putting it in place and just letting it sit there. You have to work on it, you know, daily, absolutely daily and reward, challenge, put systems in place, have conversations and it's a constant, yeah, it's just constant work. Were there ever moments where you kind of doubted what you were doing or you thought, am I doing the right thing here? Am I, am I putting in the right structures? Is this the right culture I should be creating? Certainly when, when we were one and three and we were 10, you know, we were four or five goals down, um, you always had moments of doubt. There were some conversations we couldn't ever, we could never come to agreement on alcohol. That was probably a big frustration of mine you know like it was sort of like well guys we're going to be a high performing team so there's certainly some conversations that but not so much the system as a whole I was always and to the players credit yeah they really embraced it from day one there was little nuances within the system where I'd I'd get frustrated in meetings or I get frustrated with players um, potentially I'd say things in press conference and players would so it's, it's constantly managing. The overall system, probably not. But within the system, you're always questioning yourself and making sure you're doing the right thing by your footy club, your players, your coaching staff and things like that. Um, so overall, it worked pretty well. But yeah, 100% during those periods of time, you've, you've got to self-assess and make sure you're doing the right thing. Yes, and it, being self-aware as a as a leader, both as a player and a coach, I think is um, when you, you can tell when you have you have coaches that are that are self-aware and they're working on themselves and they're understanding it. Were you doing? I know yesterday we when on our short phone call we'd spoken about uh, mindfulness and meditation and things like that. Were you were you implementing those things into your life already, or were you doing them? Were you were you doing them as a person? And then how much did you? integrate that into your team yeah it was i was we've been meditating for many many years and my wife tammy did a um a thesis on meditation so she's educated in relation to that as well so i think i think being a naturally calm person sort of helped you know my personality as a player i was very competitive but i was also very i was able to stay pretty calm so i had a, a calm personality i was meditating as well and then we did Tammy brought in meditation non-compulsory to the Sydney Swans, but it was no coincidence that the guys that did it regularly were our best players, you know, Adam Goods, Craig Bolton, Jude Bolton, Brett Kirk. So we, we brought in with the young guys, just non-compulsory. And I think the great thing about players and footy clubs is that they, they are inquisitive. The ones that want to be the best uh, just want to be the best. They don't really... Mm worry too much about it you know how whether it's acupuncture or whether it's yoga or pilates or meditation so we introduced it 2003 which was quite um early in the in the um landscape of mindfulness and, and looking after yourself um and the players took to it the, the better players did and they did it really well and but tammy and i did it regularly i'd meditate most days but i would always meditate the day of the game you know to give myself some real clarity and focus and what I've found is often through that meditating, because you'd imagine what game day's like, you're sort of always thinking, what am I going to say to the players or how it's going to go? And there's so many times they come out of a meditation and I go, oh, that's what I've got to say to the players today. You know, I really understand that. When we went to Melbourne, um, it became compulsory. We did meditation before each of our main training session. And I think in year two or three, we did visualisation before every game. We did it about two hours before the game and I would talk to the players at Melbourne about what our expectations were and then Tammy would come straight in after me and we'd visualise what that would look like. So it became 
a lot more mainstream. And even now, you Dusty Martin talks about it. Richmond, Heath Shaw talked about it two weeks ago in an interview. So AFL clubs are incredibly progressive about, hmm. you know, looking after their players and, and trying to find the edge and trying to, they are generally a high performing model. I think you're right about that. The players that are, tend to be the best, they're def, definitely inquisitive in getting better. They're drawing out those one percenters. Um, they're, I've always said like these tools of whether it's mindfulness, meditation, yoga, improving your physicality, your mental, your mental game as well. There's nothing really you can lose from it, from trying at least, from trying and, and getting better. Um, it's just, and then it goes back to kind of like how much you want to get better, how much you want it, how much you're willing to, to kind of sacrifice, do things differently and things like that. And um, yeah, it's amazing that I've definitely seen that over here in Australia. They take to it a lot easier. It's a, a much more of an understanding of, yeah, I'm going to do this to better myself. Um, it sounds like you were definitely leading that in the way in, in AFL. Um, how much of what you you did at Sydney because obviously you ended up ending that streak uh, of of 72 seasons um and you won the premiership in 2005 was that a big relief at the time like oh it's worked this has worked or was it like a, a sense of like I told you so <laughs> um yeah great question um I remember probably the best way to answer I, I remember being in Maui after the 2005 premiership and I would never do this in Australia. And I remember sitting on a little private beach with a Swans premiership hat on and I, <laughs> I would not do that in Australia, but I was sort of sitting there and there's two things that happened. One, I sort of thought to myself, wow, this is the first time in my 20 years of footy I've felt that a season finished. So the sense of accomplishment. So there was no sense of, I told you so it was more, the sense of accomplishment for the whole football club, the whole South Melbourne, Sydney thing, that's when it really hit me. It was it was quite amazing, that wave of emotional thought, thinking, wow, we have achieved something. So it was never about me. It was sort of, that was really cool to think mm. for the first time ever in 20 years, I feel like a season's finished. And I never really, I didn't realise I had never felt that a season hadn't ended but when I was playing I just would have a break go back to training so I didn't really know what it looked like suddenly we won a premiership and it was like wow with a season that's just finished and we won it. we collectively so it was it was a certain sense of relief and excitement and calm and um and just a sense of fulfillment I guess and then an Irish bloke come up to me I was on the beach and he goes oh you're batting for the Sydney Swans do you and I was like <laughs> Oh, he said, you watch the grand final? I said, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I was, I'm actually the coach. He goes, you're fucking aren't, are you? Like, they always wear <laughs> that tight going. But, so it was actually pretty cool. Like, he was, like, so pumped up, you know, standing here, watch the grand final, watch Ty Canelli. And, you know, so then it sort of hit me again how much, you know, impact it does have on everyone. But it was really collective. And that was probably the, the biggest thing that hit me. Even on the day, it was never about, one individual it was really cool to be in the coach's box after the game with all the coaches walking on the ground seeing my family seeing all the people that put money into the footy club all the administrators all the benefactors all the past players I think so from the moment the sound siren sounded I realized that how big this was for the footy club and it was never about any one individual and I was really relieved that what we embarked on collectively worked and the mm. significant impact that still has, I guess, to this day with Johnny Longmire, who was with me, you know, when we started in 2003, John was my assistant coach. So the impact that it, that it has when you get it right is just extraordinary. Yeah, that, that's lovely. Like the fact that you can sit there and say that as a team, we took it on, we took, we changed the way we were doing things and that pride in each other of, of actually achieving it. That's a, a, an amazing place to be in as a team and, and, it's all credit to the stuff that, that they were doing as well as you implementing a lot of the stuff. Um, so you finished at Sydney uh, in 2010 and then and then you had a bit of a gap before going to Melbourne. What was going on in that gap and then what was it like stepping into Melbourne? Um, were you trying to do similar things yes, at Melbourne? 
Yeah, so did the gap. I worked at the Swans Academy, which I loved for three years and did some media stuff and just observed, you know. Then going to Melbourne, like Peter Jackson was the CEO and he was really brutally honest. He didn't sugarcoat it at all. And he told me, you know, how tough it was going to be. I met with Glenn Bartlett. He reiterated, reiterated. And Dave Misson, who I mentioned before, was on my fitness guy at Sydney. He was at Melbourne as well. So I met with Dave Misson, I met with the leadership group and then eventually agreed to do it. And I say this respectfully, and this is hopefully doesn't, people don't take this that I'm arrogant, but there's no way known a junior coach couldn't have, could have done that job. And, and I couldn't have, had I, had I not had the Sydney experience, there's mm. no way known I could have taken on the Melbourne job. It was just, just too difficult. But having the Sydney experience, knowing, you know, the mechanisms you need to put in place, bringing coaches that I trusted from Sydney. I brought all the coaches in from Sydney, Georgie Stone, Benny Matthews, Daniel McPherson, Brett Allison. So having those guys as allies, having Jade Rawlings was the only coach that stayed, but Jade, I knew well, having Dave missing there. So there was some things that if they weren't in place, then I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have taken the job because it was just so, so difficult. You know, when I, and I say this respectfully to the Melbourne people for me and hopefully they don't take offence to it. It's just, the way I do things, you know, when I took over at Sydney, as I said, from Rodney Ead, you know, we had a lot of really good things in place. Like Sydney, sorry, Melbourne, when I took over, they were two and 20 and they had the fifth worst season in AFL history. And they had six or seven years of poor performance and they put in some mechanisms that were very hard to, to, to um, change, you know, because the habits are formed from 18 to 22. So look, it was tough, really tough, but I knew the system. We put it in place, the system. Um, we had to vary it slightly from what we did at Sydney and we were able to, to the players' credit, they're a good bunch of guys. They just didn't know what they didn't know. We had to do two reviews. So we reviewed our whole group and then we got our leadership group together and we, we had to work really hard with our leadership group to say, guys, you can't be on the video. You can't be doing these things. Mm. To your point before, you mentioned about some of the teams you'd work with and the leaders just didn't have great, you know, habits. They didn't really know it. So that was one of the biggest things we had to do with our leadership group at Melbourne. Say, so guys, we cannot create a high performing team if you're on the video, if you're doing the wrong thing. So we had to work enormously with that group mm. of players. Um, we had to break up our behaviors from preseason behaviors to in season behaviors. And we had to just review and review and review and review and review and review. And review. Um, and it just took a lot of, took time. And, you know, I was really pleased the way the players took it on board. The coaches were with me and, you know, pleased to get it from where we got it to, to where we, we ended up before I left. And two years ago, you know, one of the great moments in footy is when they played in the finals. You know, I've got a photo downstairs of Nathan Jones kicking the goal, you know, to win a final. And, you know, they lost their way last year, but they're very much on, on the right path. And, mm. you know, with Simon Goodwin, a young coach, as long as he sticks to that process and sticks to the behaviours and drives the standards and gets his game plan in good shape, um, they're in really good shape. But there was enormous challenges and it was a, it was a great challenge. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, on that review process, that's um, that's something that a lot of people can, can cringe at when they're being reviewed. And I think a lot of people go into... Uh, reviews whether it's in sport in business they get nervous because they feel like their their weaknesses are going to be shown how was what was your review process like in order to get the the most out of people how did you kind of go about it and what do you think where do you see the value lies in that yeah it's a really good point and often we would review more negatively when we win and I learned yeah. that because you're yeah. right. People, when you when you lose, people come in with a bit of fear and they go, oh, I, I already know I've done this wrong. So often our most critical reviews were after we'd won a game. Yeah, because that's a great opportunity to say to guys, um, and going to Melbourne, we won four games in the first year. We, we were more positive than negative. You know, we had to be positive. We had to show... There's some really good data on um, positive to negative ratio. I think it's four to one. You've got to give yeah. four positive to one negative yeah. feedback. So we had to be really positive at Melbourne. You know, a lot of it was well done. Well done. You did this really well. We had to show them what it would look like to do it well. So that was a, a really big challenge to be able to change a, a, a lot of guys that had been beaten down and beaten down and beaten down. So the Melbourne thing was be positive, be positive, build relationships. We had to build really strong relationships. 
Because the big other thing is with leadership, it's got to come out of head into heart. You know, great leaders going forward are going to be a little bit in the head, but more in the heart. And if mm. someone, if, if, if you're a player and you know your coach cares for you, then you're not looking at the vision from a critical point of view. You're saying, well, this guy wants me to get better. That's why he's, that's why he's showing me the vision. But if mm. you use the old analogy of the CEO's kicking my ass or the coach kicking my ass, then it doesn't have as much impact because it just comes from a hierarchical point of view. So we built really strong relationships at Melbourne. We tried to do that in the first three or four months. And I think the other thing about feedback is give them solutions. You know, don't just give feedback for the sake of it. Yeah. Give a solution. So you're saying to a guy, okay, you didn't do this, do you understand? But we're gonna work with you now really hard to make sure you know what that looks like in game time. So we spent a lot of time doing that as well. You know, just here is solutions, here is solutions, here is solutions. And at Melbourne, we'd often take vision of other teams and we'd say, guys, have a look what Kieran Jack did. We just played Sydney. I remember showing us a vision of Kieran Jack. And I said, guys, look at his running ability. Look what he did. That's what I'm asking you to do. So why are you showing the vision? Are you showing it because you want to belittle someone or are you showing it because you want the team to get better? Massively mm -hmm. different you know, where that headspace is coming from, coming from head or heart. You know, yeah. I love you guys. I want to get better. I want you to have the success that the Sydney players did because it's pretty special when it happens. Did you did you review yourself in all this? And did you did you get yourself to do it? Did you get the players to review you? Did you? What was your review process looking like as a coach? Yeah, hundred percent. The players would review the coaches constantly. You know, are we? What you know? What are we doing well? Um, and we'd always have that conversation. You know, and and I would often have players come in and and challenge me and say, you know, I thought what you said at three quarter time was not the right thing to say. And they'd say, what do you think? I'd say, well, look, if you think that's the case, then you're you're right. If if you know, I would always take on board yeah. what they were saying because the only reason I existed was for the players. That's the only reason I was there, to make the players better. So if at any stage that they felt that I wasn't making them better, then I would have to take that on board. Mm. Stewie Maxwell was was honest with me. Brett Kirk was honest with me. Leo Barry was honest with me. You know, it was a little bit different at Melbourne because we had to we had to upskill them more. But Nathan Jones and I had some great conversations. Jack Grimes and I had some great conversations. Yeah, and there was always an open door policy. If you're a leader and you're stuck in your office or sending emails and not interacting with people, you're really not a leader. You're just a CEO by name, really. If you're not yeah. prepared to get feedback from your staff, well, you're not really a leader. You know, you're there just to be a CEO, whack, get your pay packet, tell everyone what to do, and you'll create a, depending on your product and where your product sits in the marketplace, just you can still be successful. But you won't be anywhere near as successful as what you can be when you create this really great environment. So we talk about psychological safety, creating safety for your staff to have honest conversations, to get feedback. Great leaders ask great questions, you know, and if you can create that, it's just amazing how, how cool it will be for your sporting team or your business. It just goes through the roof. They're, they're ugly conversations you can have and they can feel they can physically feel tough and some people really really have an adverse effect uh, feeling on them um but I, they're such they're such worthwhile conversations they're the good conversations they're the things of and i think you you hit the nail on the head there where it's coming from a place of i'm only here to care like and and i'm not here to to knock you down into the ground i'm here to build you up help you get better and it, if a leader can do that and show that that's that's where those conversations can flourish yeah you're absolutely right it's also understanding how people consume information we do a lot of stuff on profile yeah. so you can't give the same information to someone that's a high red or very analytical than you are that's a yellow, which is more personality based. You know, the, the guy yeah. in you know, red wants, just wants it straight. Just tell me, you know, what am I doing well? What am I not doing well? You know, the, the other personality, the yellow personality, you might have to take out for coffee and you might sit down. And, and that's the art of leadership as well. How are you giving that information? So it's not a comp. We don't give gold stars out at the end of the week for the amount of feedback you've given. 
what we do is we want to know, is that feedback effective? So in a team environment, if an assistant coach is better to give that feedback to an individual player because he's got a better relationship, then, then let him give that feedback. In a work in, environment, if someone's got a better relationship or you need to build that relationship first to give the feedback, build the relationship first. Because mm. it's, not it's not an ass-kicking competition. It's not a competition about how many positive things you give at the end of the week. It's about high performance. How are we going to make this team better? That's all it comes down to. And if, as long as we have that, as long as we have the care factor, the psychological safety, and when we give the feedback, if it is a bit negative, wrap your arms around someone. But I will help you through. I know this is hard for you to hear, but I'm actually here to help you. Like, I'm not going to give you this feedback and just walk out of your office. Let's now put a plan in place for you to get better. Um, and, and good businesses, good footy clubs do that really well. Poor footy clubs, poor businesses just don't do that at all. Yeah, problem um, giving solutions over problems. I think that's a huge, huge thing when you're giving feedback. Don't just dump a grenade on someone and, and go, there's your yeah. problems and I'm, I'm off help them yep. encourage them and you wrote that in your book about there being each individual in the team being different and you need to treat them differently i i one of the things we did we have you done insights is that what you've because you've got yeah, the, yeah, the red insights. yellow green yeah. green blue yeah, red, we yeah. did it at, yeah and i loved it i think it's it's probably one of the things that has held me in good stead for my life now in just opening my yeah. awareness to uh, initially i was a young player but it opened my awareness of how to talk to people and we did some pretty brutal sessions where we were i don't know if you did it where you were speed almost like speed dating within the team and you would go through we, we went through each player one by one and giving them yeah. motivational feedback and then developmental <laughs> feedback and you know, but then within that each with it with those players there were we saw who had what personality and i knew that i could be very direct with some players because that's how they needed to be i could just be like look mate you're selfish and then bang you give them that in info or if it was someone else who i knew was a bit more green blue and and need and, and loving and caring that like you had to um give that feedback in a different way like look mate i realize you're pulling people different directions and that tone of there's so much to be said in like the tone of voice you say things in the way you said it being aware of the words that you have and the impact that the words that you're you're saying can have on someone because it's very easy for a, a player or a coach to just say something emotionally and then just kind of have to reel it in after that it's um it's a really interesting point that i learned along the way um as to as to developing my interpersonal skills yeah, definitely. And it's one of the first things we do at Performance by Design when we do our kickoff days is we try and encourage the companies to do the insights, to do the profiling. And then we have a really good discussion around what it looks like. And we did it with the players at Melbourne as well. And it is transformational for a lot of guys. I remember Jack Viney, who was a real hard ass, just, and I can't speak highly enough about his transformation, about how the way he then started to give feedback and started to understand other personalities. And it really transformed into a much better leader. Um, so it has a significant impact because you are, yeah, you, know, you want to, if you want to make a difference, it, it has to be about the way you give the feedback. It, it's, mm. and there's this notion of as a leader, I'm just going to have to be direct and I'm going to have to give it. And if they don't bloody accept it, well, bad luck. No, no, hang on. How can you, how can you help them accept it? How, how that's part of what you do. And, we talk about it a lot as CEOs and coaches. You know, if you're, a, if you're a leader that's predominantly in a red or blue, you still have to step out of that colour. You can't stay in that colour the whole time. You have to step out of that colour and get into yellow and get into to green, you know. Yeah. And that's why it can be quite exhausting as a leader. Um, you have to understand that concept of giving the feedback. Because the only reason we give the feedback should be to make people better. Okay, not to say, well, if you don't take one on board, we can get rid of them. That's that's not the reason we give feedback. The reason is to say, well, how do I help him understand that feedback? And then how do we, how do I create a solution for that feedback? And I think one point you touched on before, which was really valid, you can damage people unbelievably by giving feedback directly and, and offending them, you know, if you don't understand their personalities. And that's one thing I learned as a player. 
I saw relationships just destroyed after games of football when coaches would just get up and just shoot at the hip and just go around the room. And they just couldn't get that. You can't get that time back. You know, it's very difficult when you've slaughtered a staff member in front of everyone, you've slaughtered a player in front of everyone, you've already said it. It's very difficult yeah. to get it back, you know, and it's a really important point. Yeah. So with the with the work that you're doing with performance by design, because you've moved you've moved away from football, um, do, do you miss it? Do you actually miss the game? I miss winning. You know, you miss collectively, as you know, collectively. There's nothing better than. Yeah. And I remember, like Sydney, obviously, is, Sydney. Um, yeah, there's a lot of success there, but but equally at Melbourne, I remember the first win we had at Melbourne. I remember the smiles on Maxi Gorn and Nathan Jones. Yeah, I remember one of the best wins I've ever been involved in was we Hawthorne used to just destroy us at the Melbourne Footy Club and it was so frustrating because they were such a good team. And in my last year, we played them towards the end of the season. We were about a goal up at three-quarter time. We kicked six or seven goals in the last quarter. And the smiles and, you know, Maxie Gorn and Peter Jackson and the board members and, and just this notion of we're not this team that gets their ass kicked every week now. We're actually, you know, and then to see Nathan Jones, as I said before, you know, when I was commentating for Fox Footy and Max Gorn and those little and Lewis um, and Neville Jetta, you know, the guys that I've been associated with for a long period of time, winning finals, you know, two years ago. So, yeah, you miss that because it's just very hard to duplicate mm. in everyday life. But I love the leadership. I love, you know, helping people and developing leaders because similar in footy, you know, if you look at leaders in business, they're technically very good and they often get promoted just because they're really good being accountants or lawyers or salespeople. All of a sudden they look down one day and they're in the C-suite executive team and they're like, shit, I don't have any leadership skills at all. Yeah. I've never been taught how to lead 50 people, 100 people, 2,000 people. And there's such a dearth of leadership now. You talked about self-awareness. A lot of leaders don't have great self-awareness. Empathy, building relationships, vulnerability is huge now, giving and receiving yeah. feedback. So I just love it, you know, now that because I know sport has had sport has made that transition. Yeah, you know, we look at Damien Hardwick, the vulnerability piece that he's talked about, winning two of the last three premierships, Nathan Buckley's transformation, what happened to Sydney in back two thousand and three, what happened with Bomber Thompson at Geelong, Alistair Clarkson at Hawthorne. That transformation has happened, but in mm. business it hasn't happened yet. You know, the leadership has not transformed like sport has. So I just see enormous opportunity, enormous exciting time for businesses to jump on board a behavioral based system, a vulnerable system, a psychological, creating psychological safety. There's so many opportunities that exist in business and the teams that embrace it are just going to go through the roof after this you know, period of time. Do you feel, do you feel that's a thing because we're in business where because in sport, in a changing room, you are you can, it can a changing room can be brutal. Whether it's a joke or something like that, there is feedback constantly coming on. There's and you kind of do know where you stand with things, like you said about uh, players coming into a feedback session. Okay, I know what I did wrong. You, in in your mind, you do know that that's gone on. Or there might be players that pull you up on stuff every now and then. So in business, are you seeing that there are leaders who? probably haven't had that feedback throughout their careers or haven't had that um, that that colleague, I guess, banter or even sort of hardness that comes from interacting, telling each other your strengths and your weaknesses and things like that. Is that is that something you're seeing quite often? Yeah, I think you and I are really fortunate because I, don't I didn't realise how fortunate I was to be in a team environment for so many years. And I, I worked as well. So I worked all the way when I was playing at Fitzroy Tour and I played at Sydney. But I don't think, I think we take for granted that notion of team and feedback. But I think what I'm seeing in the corporate world, you've got to get your framework right first. You have to understand what your purpose, values and behaviours are. And then you have to get cadence in your meetings. So yeah, we talk about little and often conversations, which happens at footy clubs. So you have to create that environment first. Once you create that environment, we know what we're going to stand for. We know what our purpose, values and behaviours are. And we're going to create these little and often conversations where we're rewarding and challenging these behaviours. Then it just becomes part of what we do. And that's probably the biggest difference between sport. Sport have made a conscious decision to do it. Business don't still don't see it as valuable enough to put time aside. It's starting to get there. 
and the teams we're working with, I, I was on the phone yesterday with a, a CEO of one of the um, a, a big company in Australia, and she said, Paul, if we hadn't have implemented your system, we wouldn't have got through this period. We just wouldn't have got through this period. So mm. they're starting to realise the value of it, and we're having some really good conversations. We work with some great, great leaders, um, you know, and it is starting to change. The, the, it is starting to change. And through our system at Performance by Design, it's re really simple. But it is about, to your point, little and often conversations. You have to set a time. Yeah, it might be half an hour, Monday morning check-in. You know, right, guys, mm. we're having our Monday morning check-in. You know, what went well last week? What didn't go well? Who wants to reward someone? Oh, look, I'd like to thank Lewis. You know, the way he helped me last Friday at a team meeting was fantastic. Really goes to our behaviours of supporting, you know, telling the truth and actioning, you know, actioning what we said we're going to do. Thanks, mate. That was great. But mm. but you have to do it. You can't leave it to chance. You know, yeah. I talk about, you know, taking, taking the chance out of culture, you know, role models as leaders, creating a culture code. What is our culture code? You know, they're the things, if you get it right, it's incredibly powerful. What, what is there something that you're when you go into a, a company that's that's really struggling for that leadership is there something that you do straight away that is is your go-to thing that you would try and change or you believe because obviously your 25 points that you have is there something that um you feel is one of the most valuable parts of it I, I love the part where you talk about treat people as you want to be treated um and and is there something that you you add in? or you feel is the most valuable to begin with? Yeah, a couple of things. I think because a lot of companies have their sort of um, purpose and values. Probably the first thing is get underneath your values. Because let's say you and I created a company and we had passion, resilience, mm. um, and the communication. But passion might mean something slightly different to you than it does to me. Yeah. If we can flesh out what passion is, what communication is then we can start to have some really so that's the first thing most companies have that but they don't get down to the behavioral framework okay then through the process the most senior person in the room if they can set the tone at the end of the day and say right oh guys i want you to give me some feedback on what we've done today then mm -hmm. it becomes unstoppable because what mm -hmm. they're doing through that is creating a really safe environment. Gee, hang on. So Rusey's prepared to sit out in front of everyone and, and and get some honest feedback based on the behaviors we've just spoken about. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. So mm. they're probably the two things that I love most. How do you want to behave? And it, yeah, it's, it's obviously longer than a two minute conversation, yeah. but then the ability to get that leader in front of the group that says, yeah, I'm, I'm all in. The ones that I know aren't going to work, and I and we had um, a partners meeting today, and, and some of the, the the where the leader doesn't want to be held accountable, it's very hard to work. Yeah. yeah. If the leader doesn't want to be held accountable, and we've had some companies that we've sort of dropped off with them, because it becomes really difficult. And you touched on it before, mate. You said before. Look, I was in cultures where I thought we had pretty good, the leaders did, but the leaders just their actions weren't great. Yeah, so it just blurs the whole thing. It's you can't get a high performing team unless your leader is prepared to say, yes, we've come up with a set of behaviors. I'm going to be a role model. We'll still work with those companies, but it becomes really hard. There is a point where you've got to make a decision and you've got to say, well, is it worth it or not? Mm. And and you can see the frustration with the staff. The staff just love what we do, but they can see it. They can see that the leader is not embracing it. And then it becomes really, really difficult. And we're, we have honest conversations with the, the leaders. You know, we'll tell them, well, it's not working because you, you don't want to be part of it, you know. So we have those conversations, but they're probably the two key things. Get underneath your values. Yeah. What are the behaviors? How do you want to act? And the leader creating that really safe environment that says, I'm prepared to give some feedback. I want to create a really safe environment because I want to ask great questions. I want to know what what is empowerment. You can't have empowerment if the leader's saying, oh, I don't give a shit what you talk about. You know, this is yeah. the way I do it, not the way we, we do it. So there's some funny things that I love, 
you know, what's, what's leadership, what's culture, what's empowerment. People still don't really understand what those concepts are. Yeah, that, that, that is a, a huge, huge point. The behaviours leading, creating the values almost. And they, we've, I did that being in meetings where the values, and you, you hear it all the time, there'll be every, loads of businesses being like, what are our values? Respect, honesty, yeah. drive, whatever. Yeah. And you go, well, yeah, what the hell do those look like? And that's where you kind yeah. of have to go through a bit of a, a hand-holding process of say like, well, this is, yeah. this is actually what this looks like. And, and then going into some of the stuff you said in the book about the, the actual team creating those behaviors, if those behaviors are created from within, then yeah. they, they, they run it, they run it. Uh, and I look at, I'll give an example of, of sort of when it, it, we saw a behavior that would show respect. So respect was one of our things and, and respect for us was shown as you are turning up to every game in this kit. If this is the yep, kit that you're exactly. going to wear. So these, this is the shirt you wear. This is the trousers you wear. These are the shoes you wear. Yep. So that's what we're doing. And you are showing respect to the team, each other by wearing that. Flip flip side where it fell apart was where a ju- we would jump on a bus and a junior player would come on and he he had maybe like the wrong shirt. He maybe had like last year's shirt on and everyone yep. nails him, finds him. And that was the repercussion from the inner circle. Two months down the line, a senior player gets on the bus yep. with nothing that resembled the kit and nothing happened. And that's where it just fell apart yep. because the leaders exactly. weren't. Yep. And that's a great example of how it's not lived and then it just fell apart intrinsically. 100%. Look, it's a great analogy. It is an amazing analogy because you're right. Is What is respect? And then if you have that conversation without having the, well, we will dress appropriately for every game, then you're having banner back with, yeah, but that I believe that's respect because look at what I'm dressed. If you have it really clear, but then to your next point, you have to challenge it. You can't then mm. just let it go. You can't agree on a set of behaviours and then let it go. Um, and that was the great strength of the great teams that, that I've been with is they don't let it go. They say, hang, hang on, that that's not the way we... But, it's, but it even gets further than that because that's what Stewie Maxfield does. That's not what I do. That's what Michael mm. Jordan does. He says, oh, hang on, that's not the way we do it here. Go and get changed. That's when it becomes really, when the leaders are doing it and they're, they're the ones that are, that are challenging it. And it's funny, when the conversation in our kickoff days, when we start going from the values to the behaviours, that's when it gets really meaty. And that's mm. when people start to say, we, yeah, and we say to them all the time, but who is the most respectful person in the room? Oh, okay, right. What does that look like? Well, he always turns up on time. Ah, right. Now we're coming up with a behaviour. Now mm. you know what respect looks like. Let's flesh that out some more. So if the most respectful person in the room always turns up on time, always speaks politely, now we're starting to flesh out what our behaviours look like. So that's a really good way to look at it. If you've got a set of values, always look to who is the most compassionate person. Compassion is one of our values. All right, guys, let's flesh out the behaviours. Who is the mm-hmm. most compassionate person in the room? What does it look like? And then you're going to get to some real pull through. Yeah, and you those leaders need to be willing to be challenged as well. They need to be willing to have that 100%. challenge from it and and also be willing to um be challenged by what you would regard as the smallest person in the room so i'll give that going back to that example of a leader jumping on the bus wearing the wrong kit and if a junior was to a junior should be in an environment where they feel or a rookie or a first year or whatever they should feel empowered enough to stand up and go that's not our value that's not what we do and yeah. and and um yeah uh, poor poor systems that I've been in were when that happened and then the the junior got belittled by doing it. And yep. and I thought, well that 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 you've just you've lost a good player. You've lost a team member. Yep. And 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 then when you want to call on them the most when um whether it's a game yep. and, and you need them to perform, don't be surprised if they don't perform. Not because they don't want to perform for you, but because they don't have the confidence, they don't have the the belief in themselves within that team to perform at their best. <laughs> That was something that is... And ultimately, is... ultimately, they don't respect the leaders, ultimately. Mm. So, and I talk about this all the time in, in the workshops we do, that everyone knows what's happening in your organisation. Let's not pretend they don't. 
it's just whether you turn a blind eye to it or not. Everyone knows in a cricket team what's happening. Everyone knows in a footy team. It's just mm. whether you're awarding it or challenging it. So it's nothing, there's no secrets. So that young, young player in that moment has lost the respect of that leader. And also most people on the bus, if they're really honest, are the same. They've lose the respect, but they're just not prepared to challenge the leader because you haven't created a safe environment. So there's this bullshit element that's going on in the bus at that moment. Everyone knows we're not serious about our culture. No one's prepared to say it. And it's under pressure when things fall apart. And that's why those teams never become great teams consistently over a period of time. I talk about talent-based teams and behavioural-based teams. Talent-based teams can still win, but they just don't win consistently. You mm. know? And when that talent yeah. leaves then their performance just plummets. Behavioural-based teams have a consistent level of performance and they win consistently. One man in, one man out. One man in, one man out. And that's the biggest difference between those two. Talent-based, do you want to be a talent-based team or organisation or do you want to be a behavioural-based team and organisation? Yeah, both in sport and business, it's whether you want that longevity in what you're doing, in whether you, yeah. you've... Are you there for the quick buck or, or the quick win? Um, or are you creating... Everyone talks about a legacy. Like there'll be yep. people that want to make their legacy and I want to leave my mark. But a legacy doesn't come from just doing something once or doing it, doing behaviours once. It's doing it over and over again and hoping that... Well, knowing that in 10 years' time, that's a behaviour you're still going to be doing. And that's something that everyone else can be doing. How much of what you do is setting up people for that that longevity of of business? Do, and there must be businesses that are out there to make a quick buck. They want to win, and yeah. almost being really challenged at the moment in with everything that's going on with COVID, like that that um, that inner structure. Who's there? Who's really holding on to um, the business and the team and the, the the everything that's going on? I mean. Yeah, I mean, the other way to look at it is, I think a great way to look at culture is, would you want your son or daughter to go into that organisation? You know, when That's I look a great back way on looking at it. Yeah. my time at Fitzroy, and I say, my parents must have been so happy that I went to that footy club. You know, and if, if my son got drafted to the Sydney Swans, I'd be so happy that they went to that footy club. Would you be happy for your son to go to that organisation, son or daughter, to go to that organisation. That's a great way to look at your culture. Mm. Mate, that's... Um, so the work you're doing in, in with uh, Performance by Design, is there is there businesses you certain you you work more towards or like industries you work better in or you really spread... Do you spread it out? Yeah, look, everything we do is transferable, but it's probably more around the leader, as I said before, you know. And I think my, 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 my recommendation is too, is, is do it earlier, do it sooner rather than later, because the best ones we, are, we work with are the ones that are sort of already a six or seven out of ten. The hardest ones mm -hmm. are when they're a two, but typically we get called in when the culture is really, really bad, you know. Yeah. So yeah. If, you, if, yeah, if you've got a good leader will work with you easily, you know, because the leader will really drive it. Um, don't wait, though. Don't wait until we talk about the weight of numbers, you know, particularly for startups. If you're a startup, get it done as soon as you possibly can. Yeah. You know, get it done because then you can create your framework. So, look, the companies, we love working with all companies, but the ones that I love working with most are probably the, where the leaders are just, well, I don't know it all. You know, you said it before. Mm. I don't have all the answers. Come in, help me shape our culture i want to empower our staff i want to hear what they, their views are i want to create this collectively together we've already got some a purpose and values but look we haven't got behaviors can you come in and help us do that you know it's it's a really it's so empowering it's such a a cool model to to be involved in it's a really simple model too i think that's the other yeah. thing you know that, that it's a it's a really simple model so we we'll, we work with anyone we enjoy all industries we have a lot of success with all of them but yeah, if you're a leader that that thinks they that don't know it all and want help, they're the best ones because I know once we get into that company, it'll go through the roof because the leader will drive it, the leader will ask questions, the leader will be happy to get out the front, accept feedback, um, and and we just go through the roof. 
Yeah, wow. I think um, look, this has been uh, it's been phenomenal. It's been amazing speaking to you and being able to to go back and forth about these topics. I think it's it's great to see it from from your side, and and then obviously I can share some of what I've gone through and and how yeah. I've seen the black and white and the night and day from from good and bad cultures and. Um, I, I really appreciate your time. If if people are listening, they can find you on uh, LinkedIn, which is probably a great yep. way to get involved with the business Absolutely. side. Obviously, you've got you've got your book. Um, here it is. So uh, that's that's something that I would re- definitely recommend anyone who's going to coaching, leadership, and just wants to have a better outlook on life. Really, I guess people should one hundred percent take uh, take a look at it. But thank you so much for your time, Paul. I really uh, really appreciate you jumping on this. Yeah, great conversation. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it.